11. The second the limbium hit her tongue, it started to swell, and Sophie barely managed to choke the liquid down before she started to gag. Breathing became impossible, and the more seconds ticked by, the more her lungs screamed for air. The room dimmed and the sounds dropped to a hum, but her consciousness didn't fade away. She felt every second as the liquid burned through her like she'd swallowed something hotter than fire. Like she'd swallowed the sun. Her stomach heaved and her limbs flailed and she tried to think through the pain, count the moments passing, search for some sign that relief was on the way, but the agony was too all-consuming. She wasn't afraid of the needle anymore. She wanted it, needed it. Where was it? She couldn't hold on much longer. Still the fire burned, rushing into her head and searing so hot she was sure her brain would melt in the inferno. Maybe it did. White light burst behind her eyelids, and for a second she felt the pressure ease. Was that it? Was she fixed? She couldn't tell. The relief was too fleeting, and the darkness that rushed in to replace it was so much worse. Cold and thick and empty, and she could feel herself sinking into it, following it somewhere much deeper and blacker than unconsciousness. And she knew with every fiber of her being that she'd never come back. She was shutting down, slipping away. Then something stabbed her hand and the new pain dragged her free. Her body thrashed and her insides wanted to explode from the pressure as a soft gray mist swelled inside her mind. She latched onto it, using it to float above the shadows as her insides heaved again. And the pressure in her chest grew so unbearable she wanted to scream. But as she opened her mouth, a rush of air filled her body. Her first breath followed by another, and another. She wanted to count them, cling to them, celebrate each one, but the fog in her head was growing thicker, and she couldn't fight the clouds any longer. She set her hopes and trust upon them and felt them carry her away. I let you out of my sight for a few minutes, and you go and almost die again, Keith said, his words like a hammer pounding on her brain. Sophie forced her eyes open and immediately closed them as the light burned too bright, she tried to speak, but all she could do was cough and hack, which made her realize her body ached in about a million places. Hey, easy, I'm not joking about the almost dying thing. Some wrinkly dude brought you here and said he'd almost lost you, twice, but he thinks you're okay now. Well, other than a truckload of pain, which he said he can't help you with because your mind needs to stay unaffected by any medicines for at least 24 hours. Any of that sound familiar? Bits and pieces. She managed to rasp between coughs. Good, then maybe you can translate this for me. Because he kind of lost me at... She almost died. Pretty sure Grady's going to kill me when I bring you home like this. I'm fine. Uh, you can't see what I see. You got this whole sweaty, slightly green thing going on. Not to mention this wicked bluish-purple splotch on your hand. Sophie ripped her eyes open again, and when they focused, she stared at the huge bruise from the needle added to her list of reasons why she never wanted to see a syringe again. I'm fine. They had to give me limbium to fix me, and then a shot of some human medicine to stop the allergy. Sounds fun. Yeah, it's awesome to be me. She tried not to think about the other things Mr. Forkel had told her about her genetics, but it was hard to do with Sylvany transmitting. Friend! Sophie! Friend! You're really fixed, though? Like, you think you'll be able to help? He didn't say the name, and Sophie didn't want him to, not until she knew for sure. I don't think I'll know until I try and see what happens. Did Mark Mr. Forkel give you any other instructions when he brought me here? He gave me a tiny sealed scroll. Said it was for Grady, or Elwyn. Who was that guy, by the way? The guy who posed as my old next-door neighbor to keep tabs on me around humans. And apparently he's the guy who made me. Made you? Like, so like... He's your father? I, I don't think so. She'd never considered that. Could he be? He was a telepath. An impenetrable telepath. And he created her. And he cared. She shivered so hard her teeth rattled. She refused to believe it. A father would never play with his daughter's genes that way Mr. Forkel had. And a father would never be able to leave her half drugged and alone on the streets of Paris even if he did believe she'd be okay. Nor would he drop her off on the hard ground of a cold cave with nothing more than her friend, a flying horse, and a scroll. 
after she'd almost died, again, unless he was the worst father in the world. Then again, Grady and Adeline had let her risk everything to find the black swan. Hey, you okay? Keith asked as she curled into a ball. She didn't want to know any more horrible things about her past or who she was. It just kept getting worse and worse. One sob slipped through her lips, and once the floodgates were open, she was, there was no stopping it. She waited for Keith to tease her, but he just scooted closer, lifting her head so it rested on his knee instead of the rocky ground. Sorry, she mumbled when the crying fit finally passed. For what? I should be braver than this. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but you're the bravest person I know. By far. Freak out all you want. If anyone deserves to, it's you. Thanks. She concentrated on taking slow, deep breaths to calm down, but each one only made her more aware of how sore she was. She could definitely feel that they'd almost killed her this time. Every part of her ached. A deep kind of pain, like a sharp pin in every cell. I want to go home, she whispered. I know, but do you really think you're up for that? I mean, it's a long flight. And the old dude said we shouldn't light leap. He doesn't think your concentration can handle it. I'm hoping, I'm hoping Sylvanie can teleport us back to Havenfield. We know where we're going this time, so we can take a shortcut. Oh, teleporting sounds fun, but do you need to rest a, lot lo a little longer? She shook her head and slowly sat up. The pain of the simple movement knocked her breath away and she clutched her chest. Whoa, that is intense, Keith said, his voice strained. You can feel my pain? I'm sorry, I didn't. It's fine. He stopped her from scooting away. I only feel a tiny glimmer. Nothing on what you're feeling, which must be unbearable. Seriously, how are you dealing with that? I don't have a choice. He helped her to her feet, and she was relieved when her legs held steady, even if it felt like her muscles were tearing. He pulled her arm behind his shoulders, and her, they hobbled to Sylvanie, who knelt as they drew close. Keith lifted her onto Sylvanie's back, and she grabbed the alicorn's gleaming neck, really, really hoping she'd be able to order Sylvanie to teleport. Otherwise, she had no idea how she'd survive the flight back. Her weary legs might actually drop off her body. Sorry, am I holding too tight? Keith asked as he wrapped his arms around her. No, it's fine, I'm just sore. How do we get out of here? She looked around, realizing the opening to the cave had vanished. You asked us, you ask us to remove the, you ask us to remove the cloaking. A dwarf said as he popped out of the ground. Dude, it's evil the way you they just pop out of nowhere like that. The dwarf glared at Keith as he flicked a switch and the cloak vanished, revealing the opening to the cave and the dark, starry sky behind beyond. Sophie urged Sylvanie to step onto the ledge and the fresh air felt good on her weary muscles. Ready to go home, girl? Sylvanie's fur bristled, and Sophie nearly choked on the horse's unease. Relax, Sophie told her. There's nothing to be afraid of. The thought had barely left her mind when a series of loud clangs shattered the silent night, and some sort of strange black net dropped from the cliff above and covered them. Sylvanie reared back, but gleaming metal orbs on the edges of the net weighted down pinning them to the ground as five black-cloaked figures repelled from above, surrounding them.